Um, hi. Howdy. <laughs> um, I really liked the point that you brought up that uh, victim privilege is more of a thing than white privilege. However, since you deny the existence of white privilege, do you also deny the white racial frame? I, you'll have to define for me what the white racial frame is. Okay. Um, the white racial frame is. Is the it like an eight by eleven or? Like a, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> like, sorry. <laughs> Explain. It's. Um, it's kind of the lens that our society looks through that um, sees white as the normative and other th other races as other. Um, well, it's. I mean, America is ethnically a majority white society, so it seems to me that statistically speaking, if you're a marketing firm, for example, and you're trying to market a shampoo, and you're trying to put somebody on the on the cover of that shampoo, and the norm is that it's somebody who's white, that makes a certain amount of sense. I mean, if you're trying to market to a black crowd, then you'd probably use a lot more black people on the on the cover of the shampoo bottle. Um, but you know, again, I, I need a little bit more specificity. If you mean in general that the entire society is oriented toward white people, no, I don't think that that's true. I think the majority of things in society are a-racial. I think that when you go to buy a car, there's very little racial about it. I think that when you go to take a class, there's very little racial about it. And I think that markets respond to marketing, and therefore if you're trying to appeal to a given market, you, you try to appeal to that market by marketing. Right. I think there's a reason that, that ESPN has, has staffed a lot of black commentators, for example, in recent years, and that's because they're obviously trying to cater to a more minority-centric audience, which is fine. That's their, that's their prerogative. So uh, I, I think that I don't like vague ideas. I like, I like when they're, they're made very specific. So I'm sorry to ask you to concretize. Do you want to make it a little more concrete, and then I can respond a little better, or does that answer it? Um, okay, I'll, I'll try. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, one of the ideas that... Uh, the white racial frame posed whites as the norm is something like uh, the beauty standard is white. When you look at Miss Universe or anything like that, all the top 20 candidates are all white, and it's things like that. Okay, um, so so to take an to take an example that that counteracts that, I think that can we have a show of hands in the room? How many guys in here think Beyonce is kind of hot? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so the the idea that. <laughs> Uh, I think Anika Noni Rose is kind of high. I mean, like the, the idea that, that you know, it's all white racial frame, I think that people have particular preferences as to beauty. I assume the judges have particular preferences as to beauty, too. Uh, I don't know that that's racially ingrained. I mean, people of the same race tend to marry the same race across every society known to man. So that's not really a shocker. I appreciate it. Thank you. Dr. Shapiro, um, on August 28, 2003, in an article on townhall.com, uh, in which you analyzed the rise of gay and lesbian studies in college, you said, if you pay tuition, you're sponsoring the militant homosexual agenda. If you pay taxes, you're sponsoring the militant homosexual agenda. If your child majors in English, you're sponsoring the militant homosexual agenda. Tell Bailey to major in math. So I guess mm -hmm. my question is, uh, earlier you were talking about grouping and how liberals do grouping. Yes. Uh, would you say that this is an example of grouping and therefore you're kind of crossing the boundary into a liberal? No. no, and I will explain why. When you use my taxpayer dollars for stuff I don't approve, then it's sponsoring a particular agenda. And it turns out that in the state of California, which now has a law on its books, for example, that suggests that we have to teach gay and lesbian history in schools, that that is, in fact, an agenda. It turns out, see, uh, here's the thing, that one, one of the things that annoys me, is the idea that, that people are unbiased. People, everybody's biased, okay? I'm honest enough to recognize that I'm a conservative. Well, you'll hear from a lot of teachers, in, in this school and others, you'll hear that they're objective representatives of the truth. That isn't true. Everybody has their bias, everybody has their politics. I'm just honest enough to admit my bias in politics. When it comes to the, the number of, the, the idea that the state is sponsoring particular viewpoints, failing to recognize that the state sponsors a variety of viewpoints, including what I think is certainly accurately termed a militant homosexual agenda when it comes to the idea that you are going to teach in schools, specifically gay and lesbian history, which is now mandated by state law, yeah, that's sponsoring an agenda. And again, the state sponsors lots of agendas. So, yeah, it's a, I mean, I, I'm not gonna run away from something that I wrote, but. Hi, um, thank you for your time, thank you for coming here. Um, I, uh, disagree with a lot of what you said tonight. Good. Um, <laughs> That's yeah, nice I, fun. I don't believe that uh, being transgender means that you have some sort of mental illness. Okay. Um, and I think that the majority of the like, psychological, um, like national uh, associations would agree with that. Um, and I think that there's a lot of evidence that um, institutional racism exists and uh, that 
it manifests itself in very real and negative and harmful ways. Okay. Um, but I don't feel any violence or animosity towards you, and I would say that most of the people that I know um, might wish that you uh, wouldn't exist, spread right? ideas. <laughs> they might wish that you wouldn't spread ideas that they find um, harmful and negative, mm -hmm. but um, they don't feel any direct ill will towards you in any well, violent way that they would carry the out. Um, so I guess what I've been feeling throughout this talk is kind of mm -hmm. this vast mischaracterization of the left as some sort of homogenous, violent, um, oppressive body. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the, mo the majority of the people that I know and the majority of the interactions that I've had with communities on a larger scale mm -hmm. um, have not matched that representation. Okay. So I was wondering if you could kind of talk a little bit about sure. the so non-violence. There, so there are two aspects to the non-violence, okay? Mm -hmm. And I think one you will agree with and one you will disagree with. Okay. So the one that you will agree with is the one that you've already agreed with, which is that you don't get to hurt people just because of what they're saying, right? This we, we all agree with. This is also the distinction. There's a reason I use the word leftist and not the word liberal. I think there is a distinction between people who are liberals and people who are leftists. I think that people who are liberals may disagree with me on politics, but they don't feel that they get to use force to shut people down. Leftists don't feel the same way. So that is an actual distinction. Uh, there is, now, here's the part where we'll, where we'll disagree. I think that if you are seeking to use the government to cram down your particular vision of society on individuals in violation of their freedom, that this is an aspect of totalitarianism. You, whether you want to shut me down or whether, or whether you want to, let's, say, let's pretend for a second that I were a baker. And let's say that I'm a religious baker. I'm a religious person, so let's say I were a baker. And let's say that I don't want to participate in a same-sex wedding because I feel that that's sinful in my own religious belief. My belief is that's none of your business. The belief of most people on the left is that there should be legislation that forces me to cater to that same-sex wedding by polls. This is true. So, now we're getting into dicey territory because now this does implicate violence. It, it implicates governmentally used violence. So, you know, you can be, I'm, I'm happy you're libertarian essentially with regard to my speech, but when it comes to my behavior, you're significantly less libertarian than I am. You can do what you want, I don't care. But people on the left deeply care what I do in my personal life, that they have, they have no right to my labor and they have no right to my services. So this is where the, the pedal hits the metal in terms of American politics, and this is where the pedal will hit the metal when the government starts getting more and more deeply involved. As far as the institutional racism, all I would ask you to consider, you can believe what you want, but I would ask you to consider this. Shouting institutional racism does not actually combat racism. You have to find individual instances, and you have to show me who the racists are so that we can fight them together. I hate racism, I think it's evil. But if you're just gonna say institutional racism every time something bad happens, there's no way to fight it. I need a policy that you're proposing, or I need a person who's actually racist so that we can fight it together, or we can determine whether the policy is good. What I find, what I find really problematic is, is the virtue signaling that I see by so many people on the other side, which is, I don't have to give you the racist, I don't have to tell you who he is or what measures I'm proposing, I just say institutional racism, everybody cheers for me because that's an approved point of view, and now we move on with our lives. You haven't helped anybody, you've just made yourself feel better. Yeah. It's really, yeah, have, yeah, have her respond, please. Um, well, I think that uh, just um, institutional racism in and of itself, uh, First of all, I would say that the majority of the people that um, do bring up institutional racism do also have solutions as to how to combat it. Um, but it invariably I think that it, involve encroaching on other people's liberty. But yes. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> I would, I would just say that um, there is kind of you, again. I feel like you're painting um, a, a wide and diverse group of people with the same brush and saying that uh, if you can't point to um, a policy or if you can't point to a person, then uh, you know, you're just wasting everyone's time. And I think that a lot of people are trying to point to policies. And while and I, I think, I think right. that the idea of pointing to a racist person mm -hmm. is fundamentally in contrast with the idea of institutional racism, because institutional racism grapples with um, implicit bias in the society as a whole, or not like, right, not like a ghost unless, machine, right, unless, but unless in you're, Unless you're connecting that to a policy, it's a cop out. Because now we're ghost hunting again. If you, well, if, I, if you just said to me, we have a problem in American society, income inequality, right, is a problem in American society. If you just gave me any problem, and I said, well, that's, this, that's the Bilderbergs' fault, right? That's the fault of the Bilderbergs, right? It's just, it's a conspiracy, it's the fault of the Bilderbergs, right? This is, this, there's all these conspiracy theories about the Bilderberg group. Now, let's say that it, it, it's the Bilderbergs' fault, or it's the protocols of the elders of Zion. It's whatever it is, there's some conspiracy out there. You would say to me, that's not useful because how, what, what are you even talking about? When you say institutional racism, it's too broad. You at least have to name me the institution. Which one is the racist one? 
which institution is racist? Tell me which, like, so we can fight it, seriously, so we can fight it together. Just shouting slogans like institutional racism is not, it's not effective. Shouting white privilege is not effective. I want to be on your side. I do. I want to fight racist. I think race, again, I think racism is, I mean, racist, racist behavior is evil. I want to fight it with you, but I can't fight it if you're not, if you're not showing me what it is. And we have to decide together if the policies you're proposing will alleviate racism or exacerbate racism. And it turns out, I think, that a lot of the policies proposed by the left, I think institutional racism is a way, is, is usually a lever for proposing a policy that is actually unpalatable to freedom and then, in, and, then, and then castigating people on the other side of that policy as being in league with the institutional racism. The policies are good or bad without regard to words like institutional racism, is what I'm saying. I wish, I, honestly, I'd love to sit down and talk with you for an hour about it because it's because it's a worthwhile conversation and I think we could actually get somewhere with it. But I think that slogans generally tend not to be particularly effective in getting us to solutions. Okay. Thank you. What's inappropriate about saying that there are been homosexuals that have been persecuted or that homosexual men and women have contributed positively to... There's nothing negative in saying that homosexuals have been persecuted or that homosexuals have been have contributed positively, but I don't think the important thing about Leonardo da Vinci is that he liked dudes. I, I, I think <laughs> the, the important thing about Leonardo da Vinci is his contribution to Western civilization. And I think that has very little to do with where he wanted to put his genitals. So where does it rise to militancy then? Where does it rise to militancy? It rises to militancy when you start grouping people based on their sexual orientation without any reference to their actual contribution to the culture. The fact is that the, the, the contributions of Leonardo da Vinci had nothing to do with his proclivity for people of the same sex. Just as, you know, Abraham Lincoln's sexual proclivities had nothing to do with his contributions. But we're not talking about, in, in California, you make, we make mention of the, a stone wall, we make mention of RV Milk, we make mention of positive people for pursuing civil rights. Okay, first of all, the, a, again, your definition of civil rights includes, for example, same-sex marriage, which is a very hot-button political topic, still in California. Okay, the idea that that's not an agenda is, of course it's an agenda. I mean, do you acknowledge it's an Absolutely. agenda? Absolutely. So it's certainly an agenda, mm -hmm. right? You just don't, you just, you don't think it's militant, and I do. That's all. Hi. Howdy. Fact number one. Transgender is not a disease. This is not my opinion. This is facts from the World Health Organization and the Amer American Psychology Association. Just like don't, gay people don't have a disease. Fact number two, it's not rich beautiful. kids stay rich, poor kids stay poor. It's not out of one, out of 1,800 billionaires in the world, 12 of them are black. Where you come from, where you grow up, how much your parents earn, whether your parents are, were married plays a major role in determining yeah, I know where you're there a question mark at the end. Fact number three, I would just like to remind you that hate speech is not free speech. Yes, it is. And my question is, since facts don't care about your feelings, why did you use false facts? Okay, so none of the facts that I used are false. First of all, yes. Uh, no, okay, first of all, uh, would you like the answer? Okay, so the, first, so the three facts you mentioned, you talked about transgenderism. First of all, until five minutes ago, the DSM specifically defined transgenderism as a disorder. It defined it as gender identity disorder, now it calls it gender dysmorphia, which doesn't even make sense. It says that depression is the actual problem, not the actual gender disorder, which again does not explain why the transgender suicide rate is upward of 40%, and the actual suicide rate for the rest of the American population is lower than 3%. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, you talked about income inequality, and you suggested that all wealth is inherited. This is nonsense. According to, according to the IRS statistics, if you are born into the bottom 20% of wage earners in the United States, you will not be one of the bottom 20% of wage earners in the United States. 90% of people will not be within 15 years. There's tremendous wage mobility in the United States of America. Plus, there is not a group of people who just sit at the very top and stay there. People move up and down, in and out of the 1%. 1% just defines the line of income it doesn't define the people who are in that 1% of income. I've been in the 1%, I've been out of the 1%. It will happen to lots of people. People who are older tend to be more likely to be in the 1%. They weren't once in the 1%, what happened? Okay, so that's number two. Number three, you say hate speech is not free speech. It depends how you define hate speech. The only speech that is not free speech is speech that overtly defends or pushes violence. Specifically, speech that is, that is generating violence, right? That's the only type of speech that's not hate speech. If I say things you don't like, that's not hate speech. And if you think that, that it is hate speech, you're a fascist. End of story. Uh, 
Uh, hey, Ben, big fan. Uh, two things. One, I'd like to call my brother Anders. Hey, Anders. Someone <laughs> out there watching the live stream. Uh, number two, I debate socialists all the time, and their only real comeback is, oh, that's not real socialism, or that's not real yeah. communism. Is there any way to really get around that and try to make them see that, look, just because your version of socialism, with that magical fantasy land version of socialism, has not been tried, doesn't mean that socialism is an acceptable concept. Yeah. So the problem is that you're arguing with them in terms of the effectiveness of socialism. So what the, that argument is you say socialism doesn't work, it fails everywhere, it makes people poor and miserable, right? That's the argument. And then they go, but that's because it hasn't been properly tried, right? That's their comeback. Here's, so here is the actual argument that works with socialism. It is immoral to steal from people even if you vote to steal from people. Okay, if there are three people in a room, and it's me, and I have 100 bucks, and you and your friend are in the room, and you vote to beat me up and take my money, that does not make it morally legitimate for you to beat me up and take my money. One of the great, one of the great lies that's been told about socialism, and you see this all the time, is people say socialism, beautiful idea in theory, but it doesn't work in practice. No, socialism is a shitty idea in theory, and it's an immoral idea in practice. Okay? The, Socialism violates at least three of the basic Ten Commandments for those who still care. It makes government into God. It suggests that you can steal from people if you vote for it. And it says that it is good to be covetous of your neighbor's ass. Right? For Bill Clinton, it has a different meaning. But <laughs> the problem for conservatives is we never actually argue on a moral level. We're constantly arguing on an effective level, on an efficiency level. And that's a problem because the left always argues on the moral level. In the end, they always say, sure, my ideas don't work, but they're fair. They're fair, right? And so what you have to say, the only way to come back to that from that is to say, no, your ideas are not fair, your ideas are theft. Your ideas are theft. You don't get to steal from other people just because you want their stuff. That's the only way to beat that argument, do it on the moral level. Otherwise, they can always argue, well, it's not perfect, it's not perfect. Okay, there's no way to come back from that because, again, they're operating in unicorn land with gumdrop rainbows and fairy skies. <laughs> Thanks. Sugar. Do you agree with the notion that ISIS and Islam are synonymous? Uh, no. ISIS and Islam are not synonymous, obviously. But is ISIS Islamic? Sure. Okay, that's, it'd be, it, it's asinine to contend that ISIS is not Islamic. Of course it's Islamic. It's just a branch of Islam that is, that is quite radical in scope. Now, I'm also going to mention here that the notion that there is a tiny, only tiny minority of Muslims who are, in fact, radicalized is not true. I mean, if you look at polls around the world, I've done a video on this, you can see on YouTube, I go through the Pew Research polls and evaluate standards based on what percentage of populations in various countries backs terrorism or honor killing of women, uh, what percentage backs prosecution based on Sharia law by the government, right? This is, and, and it turns out that actually hundreds of millions of people believe in these things. That's not the same thing as being a terrorist, but it does mean that you believe in things that are fundamentally anti-Western. So that's problematic. So is ISIS the sole representative? No, there's no sole representative of any religion. And I'm not really concerned about the idea of, there, there's some people you'll hear who will get into you know, the, the violent passages of the Quran, and, and that's not something that interests me. You can find violent passages of the Bible also, and I'm a Bible-believing Jew. You know, the, but, but what matters to me is behavior. What matters to me is how that behavior manifests, particularly in terms of the, the ideology that you believe. So, um, you know, is ISIS Islamic? Yes. Is it the only form of Islam? No. Or should we, we be concerned about radical Islam across, across the globe? Absolutely.